Welcome to everyone when we're ready, but um, uh, no, I'm, I'm really happy just to get into the program, I think. Okay, well, it's gone nine o'clock, so we'll be prompt. You will have recognised that I'm not David, so most of you know that David has uh, unfortunately had to quarantine and do everything. All this massive amount of work for this uh, event. He's um, been infected with COVID, so he's in quarantine until next week. And so he's asked me to stand in for him as the, as the MC for today's event, which of course I'm very happy to do so. For those who don't know me, I'm Michael McClure. I'm in the economics program. I mainly work in the history of economic thought, not economic history per se, but I'm absolutely very, very appreciative of work of economic historians and uh, uh, very pleased and honoured to be here today. So David, if you'd just like to say a brief welcome and then we'll uh, invite Claire to give the presentation. Absolutely. Um, I'd really like to say thank you very much, everyone, for supporting the event again this year, um, third year running, which is fantastic. And we've had some really great papers come through, and, and I'm looking forward to to enjoying those uh, throughout the day. Um, we will distribute papers that have been completed after the conference. And I'd also like to say thank you very much to Michael uh, and also my colleague, Ben Perks, who has been looking after the technology much better than I can ever look after for the technology. So I think that's a great outcome from everyone's perspective. Um, it does appear that I will survive from COVID, so at least that's a good step in the right direction. Um, but I am just absolutely uh, devastated not to be able to catch up with people, especially the interstate people. It was such a great opportunity to be able to, to say good day in person, having uh, spent so much time on the screen with you all. Um, I hope the day goes well. I hope you enjoy it. And I'll butt in as I questions and other things strike me. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, David. The sort of uh, way of operating is that we won't be doing formal introductions uh, with people's CVs and associations, etc., throughout the day. But I'd just like to know, firstly, that there's our, our keynote speaker. She's doing lots of work in economic history, which is much appreciated by the fraternity of economic historians. And so it's a real honour and pleasure to invite my Thank you. All right. 
Can everyone online hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Um, all right. So uh, thank you all so much for being here and for uh, David for inviting me. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that we meet today on the land of the Noongar people, that their sovereignty was never ceded, and that the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. So I wanted to start by telling you a story. So in a previous job at a previous institution, I was sitting in a research strategy meeting. The dean of the faculty was new to the role, and he mentioned two areas that he wanted to see the school do better in. The first was putting in, and presumably winning, grants with colleagues in medicine and psychology. They had a lot more money at their disposal than, say, the social sciences, and so working with them would increase our grant money, our capacity to do things. Great. About 10 minutes later, we'd moved on to publication outlets. And he said he wanted our members to only publish in ABDC, A or A star journals, preferably good A star journals, preferably FT50 journals. Uh, not only did that feel relatively transactional to our colleagues in medicine, but it's also just a bad policy. If you want to leverage the benefits of interdisciplinary research by accessing grants available to medicine, then you're going to be working in a team that will want to publish in their own journals like at least some of the time. Saying do interdisciplinary research, but only if you publish in this extremely narrow set of disciplinary journals is not only a little bit draconian, but is a policy that isn't really going to get you anywhere. And this is the paradox of interdisciplinarity. So we are all interdisciplinary practitioners, right? The very act of doing or reading or uh, working with economic history is an interdisciplinary one. We talk to people in different disciplines. We integrate knowledge from historians, from economists, from the business disciplines and others. Those are our inputs. Our outputs then communicate between those different domains. We, or the articles and books that we write, are the bridges that connect disciplinary silos, demonstrating the importance of an economics sensibility for historians or, say, a historical approach for economists. And this is very, this is a good thing. In the face of increasingly disparate disciplinary silos, interdisciplinary integration and communication is more important than ever. We need interdisciplinary research. It's the source of innovation, scientific breakthroughs, for creating job-ready graduates and useful real-world research. Climate change, global development, pandemics, and so on, are infuriatingly complex and rarely respect disciplinary boundaries. I think as we've all learned recently, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic has required not only understanding epidemiology, but also political science, economics, sociology, geography, and so on. We live in a very interdisciplinary world. And universities say they want this. I've just chosen a few <laughs> casual, <laughs> that's mine, that's ours. They have redesigned curricula to include cross-disciplinary instruction. They have statements on their website or in their research strategy about priorities and graduate outcomes. As interdisciplinary practitioners, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've welcomed this lip service that something's felt a little off. You know, they say that we're doing things differently now, so why don't I feel supported in my work? The reality is that the structures of universities and the incentives for work and promotion still favor work published and produced within the tribe. Some of these structures run very deep Hundreds of years of university policy has established the primacy of certain types of knowledge. Some of them are more recent, but in order to disrupt them, we would have to have some pretty serious conversations about how we fund university and what they're for. So this is the central tension. This is the real will they, won't they. 
everyone wants interdisciplinary research, but very few understand how it's produced, and even fewer actively implement policies to encourage it. So who am I? What are my qualifications? Is this legal? <laughs> Good questions. So this topic, this tension, is the subject of my new book. I have a few copies with me today if you're feeling that way inclined. I came from a background in economic theory and intellectual history, looking at the way that interpersonal connections affect knowledge. Okay. I was looking for a PhD topic, and I came up with the idea of studying the progress of economic history in Australia. Not as the work of great men, as it has been written, though there are lots of great men and great women in there, but as communities of practice. As I progressed further in the research, particularly the very long gestation that the book had, the lens became a lot bigger. Not just the work of great men, not just the work of communities, but of the structural incentives that support and encourage certain types of research. I do dunk on universities a fair bit, but I try to do so constructively to understand why universities are the way they are and why we appear to be so stuck on the sorts of policies that we can introduce. You'll hear me say several times today, no one's going to do it if no one has a job. So most of us work in or around universities, but have we ever really thought about what they are? What are they supposed to do? Universities are one of the most important organising structures for research, with the policies, programs and incentives allowing scholars to establish certain types of teaching and research activities. Universities structure the physical space where scholars interact, such as the placement of offices, the location of tea rooms and seminars. Universities determine the groupings, faculties, departments and so on that match scholars with like-minded colleagues. So, for example, is economics in your social sciences faculty or your business faculty? Universities also control cash. They decide who to hire, the incentives for funding and promotion, the degrees on offer. Universities are thus responsible for the overt barriers and the covert inconveniences that influence the way knowledge is produced. The underlying logic of universities has been centred around three distinct systems of learning, each with their own aim. So medieval universities in the UK and Europe were elite enclaves of learning tied to the clergy. So this is the English or the Oxbridge model of higher education, and it aimed to provide a common moral, intellectual and social experience for the ruling elite, with students grounded in general intellectual skills. The Scottish model was more secular, more egalitarian. Universities were there to serve the professions. Educators were responsible for imparting practical knowledge. Scottish-led universities placed an emphasis on academic disciplines as a way of organising knowledge into discrete, sort of well-understood categories. You master maths, you master science, you master geography. Finally, the German or Humboldtian model uh, of higher education placed an emphasis on scientific training and research. The university professor in this system develops new knowledge, supervises postgraduate students with instruction at the undergraduate level, a secondary or a tertiary activity. The Humboldtian model strongly emphasizes research at the frontier of siloed academic disciplines. And Australian universities combined these three systems of learning the older sandstone universities, of which uh, UWA is one, and there was one in each of the Australian uh, colony capital cities, were established in the 19th and early 20th century on principles similar to the Oxbridge elite liberal arts education. However, very quickly, the Scottish model took over, and that has been more or less the prevalent model of, of higher education in Australia with 19th and early 20th century tertiary education designed to prepare students for professional work. In the post-war period, mass, uh, mass expansion of higher education was designed along really similar lines. In the post-war period, we wanted to multiply the supply of skilled labour, particularly in the professions. 
universities came to command a much greater space in professional work and simultaneously a much greater proportion of Australia's population was trained in professional work through universities. Post-war universities also incorporated the German model to some degree. The war had demonstrated the importance of basic primary knowledge and the way that this can be applied to lots of different situations. And so this became part of the compact of the establishment of new universities and the expansion of old ones. Governments began to fund a greater proportion of research through their universities and the role of university workers expanded to include both professional instruction and research. And this is the birth of the 40-40-20 that we are very familiar with. The Australian National University, the ANU, was the only real Humboldtian university with work at the institution consisting of frontier discovery and supervision of graduate students. Since the late 1980s, neoliberal reform has corporatized Australia's higher education system. While the underlying logic of universities, so professional education, frontier knowledge, has pretty much remained the same, principles of new public management has been introduced to encourage uh, performance, apparently, through competition in new and expanded markets for students and research. So that's a brief history of Australian universities. And against that background, the main sort of narrative or story of the book is about an interdisciplinary field, Australian economic history. It's a small field that was at times bigger, wedged between the disciplinary juggernauts of economics and history, the humanities and the social sciences. Economic history is a good case study for this sort of thing because we have a lot of time to work with. Uh, it's one of the world's oldest interdisciplinary fields and has had a strong presence in most countries and uh, nations and regions around the world. In 2011, for example, there were approximately 10,000 economic historians, 44 economic history societies representing at least 59 countries, of which our Economic History Society of Australia and New Zealand, uh, Lionel's here today, is one of them. So the chapters are relatively chronological. Um, I start with the early 20th century and the production of economic historical writing born from the collection of colonial statistics. And then partnership between government research, the Workers' Educational Association and universities. Key scholars you may recognise such as Timothy Coughlin, he's up here, Edward Shan, over here, uh, and others like Brian Fitzpatrick, Douglas Copland, Robert Madgwick, Herbert Burton and so on, worked across a variety of disciplinary groups and across those three institutions. This, uh, what I call the tripartite structure and the very porous boundaries between disciplines meant that the knowledge produced at this time was extremely interdisciplinary. It was diverse, it was very practical and it integrated and communicated well, so it served that function. However, the field had virtually no collaboration, no professional structures, no real identity or shape, no collective action. So it was good for some things and, and not so good for others. Uh, in the immediate post-war period, within the context of the golden age of higher education that I described before, economic history experienced their big bang. Economic historians started arriving in Canberra to the research-only ANU from the late 1940s. And in 1951, they hired a 29-year-old Noel Butlin, who's there holding up the veranda. <laughs> he soon began work on his major piece, uh, what I like to call the numbers and the words. In the numbers, Butlin compiled Australian historical national statistics within a national income accounting framework. In the words, Butlin used these statistics to describe a sector-by-sector -sector mechanism of growth in the latter half of the 19th century. He took cues from Coughlin's you know, earlier proto-national income accounting, and he looked to capture and understand the Australian economy without a theoretical framework. 
However, his logic was a mixture of neoclassical individualism and Keynesian macroeconomics that was very common at the time. He emphasized market signals and the decision-making of rational economic actors, while also focusing on the duality of the public and private spheres and a broad acceptance of capital formation as the key engine of growth. So Butlin's big statement, uh, arguably the feature that he's best known for, was that the Australian economy was important and interesting uh, as a thing to study. Not as a footnote to the Industrial Revolution, not as a British outpost, not as subject to the vicissitudes of international trade. Butlin argued that urbanisation and domestic manufacturing, rather than its export markets, were the dominant industries in Australia from the 1870s. He argued that internal structural disequilibrium from speculation on the real estate market and inefficiencies in the railway construction business caused an initial downturn before the 1890s depression. So the depression was internally sort of prompted rather than uh, developing through the bearing crisis overseas. Although Butlin acknowledged the importance of external factors, he writes, in his mind, they're not the most interesting or the most important ones. So, Noel's contribution to understanding Australian economic history was remarkable. However, the institutional context enabled not only the production of the work itself, but also its promotion as an intellectual movement. It is hard to overstate just how much money the AME had at this time. <laughs> Butlin was able to hire a small army of junior scholars as research assistants or PhD students who were crucial in the production and promotion of these two works. They were either directly involved in data collection or they dealt specifically with matters Noel knew would be criticisms, things like the price series, the fact that he aggregated growth across the continent. This was the, the job of the juniors. Butlin's program was also congruent with and supported by both the economic, uh, economics and history disciplines in Australia, as well as key scholarship overseas in economic history, such, such as Simon Kuznet's National Income Accounting and economic historical work from the UK. I also look at a number of other contributions that emerged at the same time, things like Max Hartwell's work on Van Diemen's Land, Alan Hall's work on the London capital markets, that adopted a very similar approach to Noel, but were unconnected to him and to the ANU. So although Butlin was lauded as this totally new, totally fresh take on Australian economic history, his work, I think, was so successful because of its integration with and its similarity to what was going on elsewhere rather than its distinctiveness. I make the point somewhat cheekily that if it wasn't Butlin, I think it probably would have been somebody else with money and energy and things like that. Shortly after the publication of the numbers, Trevor Swan and ANU Economics granted Noel his uh, insistence uh, for a separate department. And through graduate supervision, seminars, joint projects and so on, he established a team or a centre for economic history in Australia. And the centrality of Canberra to the field has never really waned from that point. So this was the Big Bang, the work of what Chris Lloyd has called the Orthodox School. It gave the field uh, recognition, resources, identity and legitimacy, plus plenty of new material to debate and refine. So overlapping with this was economic history's moment in the sun. As part of the expansion of higher education and the general logic of fragmentation of universities, Departments of Economic History were established on the basis of basically compulsory undergraduate business and commerce subjects. Departments were kitted out with a god professor uh, and maybe a half a dozen scholars, mostly those men who entered the job market in the late 60s and early 70s. Around 1980, the field, overnight, went into a hiring freeze. Growth of students in the post-war period had kind of taken off, Departments were full of scholars, unlikely to retire anytime soon, and universities and most public institutions were entering a period of audit and austerity. This was 
pretty unfortunate for folks entering the job market at this point, high line. Uh, but it also meant that we had groups of six to 12 people together with tenure and very little turnover for decades. So these small departments with relatively intense connections meant there was a real locational or spatial placement of ideas. In Canberra, the group integrated with the economics discipline and the clear metrics revolution that had made waves in the US. In Melbourne, a pretty kooky bunch of leaders encouraged a more diverse interdisciplinary research program. In Sydney, most were hired from overseas and continued to contribute to their global networks rather than conducting Australian research per se. Uh, a key exception being convict workers. There are also important heterodox perspectives with the labour history and political economy crowds, fellow travellers with economic history. So all of this was terribly exciting, except there was a fair bit of conflict. The clear matricians roasted the historians, those in uh, Sydney didn't really contribute to the society or the conference, the political economists ragged on the orthodox economic historians in print and in person. <laughs> So even at the height of the field's professionalism and disciplinariness, the fragmentation between these small communities makes it so difficult to even discern a basic Australian approach to the subject. I, I tried, I really tried, <laughs> and I couldn't do it. So after about 20 years of this you know, spatial placement of ideas, growth of departments and so on, we enter a period of resistance. There were existing vulnerabilities in the way that the field was organised, with fragmentation from the earlier era, meaning folks weren't super great at engaging in collective action or advocacy. The field had become uh, very closely tied to economics overall, though due to departments was administratively separate. And that meant that the field was basically met with derision from economics, seen as a less rigorous subset, or uh, and ignored by history. Key leaders died or retired, and those remaining were a little conservative in their approach, uh, with very little interest in meeting either of the parent disciplines of the new frontier that had emerged in the 90s. So against these existing and building problems, uh, the Dawkins reforms, that's John Dawkins on the slide, introduced neoliberal market reforms to the higher education sector. The creation of revenue markets and accountabilities between units meant groups were forced to become territorial and competitive. Compulsory economic history subjects were amongst the first to be booted, and the resulting funding deficit meant that eventually all of the departments folded, with members leaving for business disciplines or remaining in economics. A few went to history. So at this point, there was a very real chance that the whole Thing would collapse in on itself. However, economic history survived, they're doing it, um, in part because of leaning into the reasons for the crisis itself. The transition towards a neoliberal university forced members to broaden themselves professionally, removing the protections of separate departments and other disciplinary structures forced members to look outwards to economics, to history, to the business disciplines and to the world. Basically, they adapted, they survived. So there are signs of a moderate renaissance since the 2010s, the publication of big projects, increased engagement from parent disciplines and emerging scholars, and an increase in diversity of work and practitioners. <laughs> there is a new interest and in new work However, several of the field stru uh, structures have been a little conservative intellectually, which meant that other more radical groups have popped up and have tended to bypass uh, traditional structures in favour of their own. We also, in terms of challenges at least, we also still work in the global neoliberal university uh, with the professional enclosure of tertiary education, university and journal rankings, particularly ERA, ABDC, and the ARC still encouraging very disciplinary knowledge. So this has forced interdisciplinary groups like economic history to sometimes fall through the cracks of uh, institutional incentives or has encouraged certain members 
to hide or conceal their interdisciplinary identities. Mm. So it's very nice to be here. Um, here's our campus. Because Perth and the University of Western Australia have been a really key part of this story. Uh, Pamela Statham Drew, who's here, uh, was interviewed by the book uh, for the book, and she gave really great insight into the way that the group at UWA developed. So at UWA, we had a small cluster of economic historians, around four or five, though it's worth noting that that rivals some of the departments over east. Pamela uh, was key, along with Mel Davies, Ian Vanden Dreisen, and Reg Appleyard. The group was very productive, uh, with important work on the Swan River Colony, convicts, mining history, labour, and demography. Members were based in economics, which, like their comrades in Adelaide, University of Queensland, Macquarie, Wollongong, and so on, created some challenges in terms of capacity building and professional identity. Uh, Pamela reflected on the challenges teaching general economic history subjects and giving seminars in an economics program as an economic historian, while also providing some uh, really good opportunities for the integration of economic history with that parent discipline. And nowadays we have a real boom, I think, in economic history in Perth. Um, we've got new people hired to history and economics groups, the establishment of the West Australian Economic History Network, hosting of the summit for the third year in a row, and of the APBH conference twice, and the new PPE degree providing opportunities for new interdisciplinary conversations with members and with students. So I think it's probably a pretty good time to be a Australian economic historian. So the story of economic history in Perth, I think is demonstrative of the opportunities we have in our field in the absence of departments. One of the things that happens quite a lot when people discuss economic history is that they say, oh, there used to be departments, now there aren't any, therefore the field is dead, it is deceased. Um, though Oxley and Meredith have conceded that, quote, the corpse still twitches. <laughs> So in the book, I talk a lot about departments. I would consider them simultaneously the protagonist and antagonist of this story. So my first issue with departments, or more accurately with the focus on them, is that it is a little ahistorical. Departments existed in Australian economic history and a very small number of other countries, principally the UK, um, but very, very few other than that. And it was for a very short period of time. Most of the departments were set up in the 60s. The full suite was uh, finalised in 1970, and they all started to close in the 1990s. The Trobes department, hilariously, was only operational for two years. Not only that, UWA demonstrates that there is a lot of economic history produced and a lot of economic historians outside of departments. Most of the major contributions to the field have been produced outside of departments. Anything by Coughlin, Chan, Fitzpatrick, Nolan, Sid Butlin's major works, Ian McLean, Cambridge Economic History. All of this work was produced without the structure of the department, with uh, authors embedded in an economics group, in a history group, or in Coughlin's case, in the government. My second problem with departments is that I don't think that they're that good for us. The reason they are advocated can be relatively surface level, in my opinion, something along the lines of, it was pretty nice to have that level of recognition and resources. And I'm not denying that it would be very nice. But it does assume that a discipline is the aim. And I don't think it considers fully the fact that economic history is interdisciplinary and should be treated as such. So while departments have been seen as the field's primary marker of success, I think they came with their own set of problems. The professional architecture of a department is designed to funnel communication and ideas inwards. Appointments, collaboration, teaching, seminars, and even the physical space are all designed to develop appropriate teams for disciplinary teaching and frontier knowledge. Folks know who they are, who they belong to. They are the economic historians. They have an identity distinct to larger groups such as economics or history. In Australian economic history, departments were generally small, 
with no more than a dozen appointments at any one time. The workforce was stable. Uh, scholars obtained tenure at a young age during the sector's expansion. After this, there were very few new appointments with very little mobility between groups. Each department had a god professor who was able to exert influence over the teaching and research program. And their physical space along a single floor or corridor encouraged close connections amongst the tribe. Activities associated with departments, teaching, joint projects, seminars, training of graduate students helped reinforce these connections and created a sense of joint endeavour amongst members of each group. Disciplinary growth does come with an opportunity cost. A vibrant seminar program within the group means scholars are not able to attend seminars or events in other groups. Collaborations that deepen connections within the field reduces the time and energy that you have to develop interdisciplinary bridges. If scholars and students all emerge from a particular major, they will have a comprehensive understanding of that area at the expense of broader knowledge and networks. So in the case of Australian economic history, departments generally held their own seminars, and as a result, members rarely went to seminars in history or economics. Economic historians had their own courses, which meant they rarely, if ever, gave guest lectures or taught into other programs. Departments trained their own PhD students rather than engaging a mix of complementary supervisors. Some economic historians found departments uncongenial for their style of working. Jonathan Pincus, for example, has, quote, never been a fan of separate departments. McLean has similarly recalled the, quote, horribly fragmented institutional structure at ANU. Division of scholars into these small groups, in his words, restricted the flow of people and of ideas and led to a poorer grounding in either economics or history. Part of the reason that McLean accepted an appointment at the University of Adelaide was because they didn't have a separate economic history group. On the other hand, the complete absence of institutional resources, collaboration and shared ideas can lead to the dispersal or fragmentation of the field's members. This is what happened to some degree during the early 20th century with satellite practitioners, you know, all off kind of doing their own thing. It's certainly what happened in the period of resistance, with practitioners so concerned with their own survival and making themselves useful to their various parent disciplines that we have a missing generation of scholars. For example, we missed a huge chunk of the digital transformation in the 1990s and 2000s that has enabled big data research overseas, simply because we didn't have the man slash woman power or the professional security to take on big digitization projects at the time. So how do we move forward? What does this history tell us about how to conduct and support interdisciplinary research? The challenge as I see it is the same one the field has been grappling with the whole time. How do we maintain diversity, but also build capacity relationships and identity. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is that if we are going to fulfill our interdisciplinary function, we need to consider the sorts of activities that we engage in. Activities or the research things we do are called communicating infrastructures. These are the places, events, ideas, methods that bring folks into the interdisciplinary space and facilitate that integration and communication. So things like a collaboration, a workshop, a journal, a publication, a theme, a curriculum, a conference. All of these can either reinforce connections within the tribe or facilitate interdisciplinarity, depending on how they're set up. So we are really in the weeds of policy design now. Hopefully you're still with me. So acknowledging that different activities lead to different outcomes in terms of knowledge, the main characteristic we need to look for is the constraint of the communicating infrastructure. How easy is it to enter the group, to move in and out? If there is a high barrier to entry, you're going to attract folks heavily committed to that area. So it will probably be a smaller group with more intense connections. Think of the level of commitment needed to be awarded and then take a new job or to work with a co-author. 
On the other hand, activities with lower constraints, so more porous boundaries, lower investment of time and energy, will tend to attract those less committed to the area. Because of that lower commitment and corresponding commitments elsewhere, it's more likely that that person will have distinct or complementary knowledge or contexts. This is what is called the strength of weak ties, as Mark Granovetta has detailed from the sociology discipline. Mm -hmm. So remember, there is always opportunity cost. <laughs> no one is only an economic historian anymore. David, for example, is about five things. <laughs> we have to work with our relevant parent disciplines as well as within this interdisciplinary group, and I think that's, that's okay. But capacity doesn't only look like departments, it, only, it doesn't only look like the Cambridge or, or us all publishing in the Australian Economic History Review, though I think you should. <laughs> Activities with more flexible or porous boundaries that allow people to move in and out and around based on their competing responsibilities, I think, is the way forward. And from a you know, policy design perspective, I really like events like today, where folks are members of their own departments or their own institutions, but we have a regular place to come together for events and workshops and conversations. Essentially, we've been doing this for years. I'm just legitimising it as a strategy. The second thing is, how do we know that we're doing a good job? What we choose to count in this space matters. Markers of success look different for interdisciplinary fields. They look really different to disciplines. But we need some markers in order to demonstrate our value to funders, to promotion committees, to our universities and so on. I make some suggestions about this in the final chapter. It could be measuring diversity of degrees or uh, majors of those who take our courses, the fact that we might use history or economics to contextualise an otherwise pretty straight disciplinary subject, the range of affiliations of those who attend our events or collaborate with us in published work, the fact that we as practitioners are not simply ten, uh, attending the AHA or the Conference of Economists, but are agents in creating conversations and networks across those groups. It's important to remember that there's only so much agency that we have. We're academics, we're stretched, we're tired, it's an uphill battle. Most university policy and incentives still favour disciplines. But I think reflecting on where we do have agency or do not is an important step. I can't entirely control who enrols in my courses. That's based on the majors and the degree structure. But I can control the amount of history they get, which at the moment is quite a lot. We can't control the ABDC rankings, but we can do things like rebrand the journal to better connect with our contributors and readers. I can't control the extent to which my work is con uh, congruent with the Conference of Economists, but I can invite folks from the Economic Society to my event. So I would recommend exploring the boundaries of that agency if you are able to. I'll leave you with this. Our philosopher Karl Popper once said, quote, we are not students of some subject matter, but we are students of problems. And problems may cut right across the border of any subject matter or discipline. The progress of Australian economic history demonstrates the unique features of interdisciplinary fields and the crucial position they occupy in the knowledge landscape, for solving major problems, training the next generation to be active and engaged citizens. I hope the book uh, does justice the field's extraordinary past and diverse futures. As Glyn Davis wrote for the blurb, I am tough-minded but optimistic, uh, which I think is a pretty good description of me generally. My major hope for universities and for practitioners is that the book illuminates how we can create broad, vibrant, cross-disciplinary spaces as the key to ensuring economic history's continued value and relevance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. That very uh, interesting, firstly, thought-provoking and, uh, and profound uh, presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, we'll have questions, and there's, there's about 15 or so minutes for questions, but as we don't necessarily all know each other, if you've got a question, if we just indicate your name before you raise it, so that it's more informally. And you can join my as well. Yeah. Okay. So any questions? Yeah. While people are thinking, I might just sort of point out that interdisciplinary um, goals 
at least been tried by universities. And um, I'm thinking of this university when I very first started um, here. The vice chancellors. I didn't know that what happened behind that, but um, we lost the names of departments. We became disciplines. That's the first thing, and groups to run the disciplines were set representing anyone from anywhere. So economics might have someone from politics or something. Right. Right. It was done. This, this was Alan Robson's goal for the university to encourage and facilitate more discipline studies. And study. it totally failed. <laughs> just totally failed. It just didn't take those overseen bodies, just disappeared. He was personally very disappointed. But it's just a case of where at least, uh, you know, sometimes just try it. It's, it's not necessarily easy to bring people with you are quite used to and sometimes comfortable with them. And um, it's not even a comfort thing, it's just like that we, <clears throat> some things like how are we going to like manage teaching this year, there is a certain certainty demanded in that that is that works better with like very strict boundaries and uh, you know roles and we talk a lot about like managerial structures and that, that certainty works a lot better with a disciplinary structure. Uh, and that's, I think, why, like, as try as you might, a department is probably not going, it's it's too rigid for the knowledge, like, to inter transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, et cetera, because there's a level of um, unpredictability in that sort of knowledge that just doesn't suit the rigidity of the structure. Yeah. Uh, my name's Ian Abbott. I'm actually in the college, so I'm a complete ring in today. Hey, welcome. But, yes, here, so pushing the boundaries here. But um, I started out in the, my career was initially in the universities and then in public service, but I started out in the 70s. So the era of the God Professor had just finished, as so I experienced that for just a couple of years. And then suddenly you ended up with a whole suite of mini God Professors who established centres, which were often just them and their little acolytes, you know, some postdocs and students. So it was sort of like a massive expansion in silos. And since then, uh, uh, you just mentioned that attempt by uh, Alan Robson to, you know, sort of go back to a more broad perspective. But um, I think it was sort of driven by uh, the, the sort of explosion in those silos was driven by opportunities with funding. Yeah, and we have modern, you know, God professors in the sense that ARC laureates are structured very similarly, you know, so you have CI or CIs at the top and they're able to hire postdocs, PhD students, etc. And they have, they often have for the three years or the four years or whatever, they have their, you know, their administrative structure. They're three years though, not 20, so that makes a difference. Um, and like, I think that depending on the type of research, that, that structure can work really well because for disciplines and for frontier knowledge and for disciplinary knowledge, you do need hierarchy, you need the leadership, you need to be able to go, okay, this is this is where the frontier is and this is how we're pushing it. And in natural sciences, for example, you often need the infrastructure and the funding like that to, to run a lab, to run the equipment and, and whatever. Um, but that's not always the best thing, I think, is, is the point that I'm making. And I don't um, think we should just entirely dispense with departments. I think that um, they're very useful, but depending on the type of knowledge you want to produce, it's not always the best solution. So we do have some on teams that are in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you can ask us. Uh, Grant, um, Grant, you're up. Oh, okay, thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me okay down there? Absolutely. Over there. Uh, my name's Grant Fleming. I was. Uh, hired by God Professor Simon Zill to enter the ANU <laughs> Economic History Department in the mid early 1990s and worked at the ANU departments from the 1990s to the 2000s. So it's kind of scary having Claire Wright talk about my life and history with our university. Our university. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, the, the, um, two um, sort of related comments, I guess, and really interested in your perspective around research outlets. Um, when you looked at the period prior to the Big Bang, when, when one looks at the early professionalisation of economic discipline in Australia in the 1920s and 1930s, establishment of departments, the economic record, uh, citation work around um, the content, one notices 
the integration of historical, political, and economic <coughs> policy together with economic theory as articles. And, and you also notice that a lot of those professors wrote books as well as journal articles. I, I, if you think about the world today, I mean, where are books? Where are projects? Where are where where are working papers that actually have people taking comments on rather than just being something you plonk on the city? Where are all those things in the context of still having to deliver um, the um, countable score that you mentioned at the start of your presentation with journal articles and the press? How does that fit into this um, new way of thinking about it? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that that's a really good point about uh, the fact that the economics and the, like as fields and disciplines develop, they you know they start off very broad, and then over time there's a there's a process of, of professionalization and enclosure where they're like right they, they you know sort of whittle down their main aim, their main method, their sort of consensus on things. And so if you look at any discipline in its early stages, there's like a liken it to star formation, where it's just dust. And then eventually they they figure out what they're doing, uh, and so that's why you have more diversity in outlets, more diversity in work in the economic record in its early stages, and how we've got increasingly narrow um, because the stars are forming. Right. Um, I do think that all of those things that you talk about are important. Uh, books, um, you know, uh, working papers, um, open access data sets, or whatever. Um, the only problem, I think, is that they're not valued in the same way in our institutional incentives. So um, if we were to be providing, um, or if we were given the same level of recognition for a book as we would for the you know, commensurate effort of journal articles, people would write them more. Um, and specifically in, in business disciplines, I just don't think that that's the case. Uh, and the same with working papers um, and of open access anything. Um, so. I think that to some degree there's things that we can do, but a lot of it has to come from like a policy or, or a you know managerial um, setting as well. Yeah, okay. My name is Dean Kotlowski, and uh, first of all, thank you so much for that providing me with such uh, context. I have to say I flew in from Canberra, and that day I spent at the Mill Bodkin Archive Center. Oh, so it's great to have this context. And the last, the, the, the other comment I want to make is I want to, I want to just tell a little story about this God professor. There actually was a member of my department who deposited his papers um, in our research center, and I'm told there's a whole collection, there's a whole file called the God Letters. And they're from former <laughs> students that begin with Dear God. <laughs> but, 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 but I do have a question here. Um, I'll say that little bit of gossip. And, and that is, you know, I think there's just this inherent tension between, I mean, interdisciplinary presupposes the existence of disciplines. Yes. So was there, is it, so there's going to be this inherent tension, I would imagine. Was there ever any radical effort to come up with another term other than interdiscipline? Well, look, I, I didn't really get into this, but there, there's all sorts of, so there's, inter, there's interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, which is different, multidisciplinary, and, and sort of historians of education, uh, like intellectual, um, you know, so, social uh, sociology of knowledge folks have all sorts of different definitions for these things. Uh, and you make a really good point about the, um, the way that interdisciplinary only exists. It's like if a tree falls in the woods, you know, interdisciplinary only exists in the context of disciplines. And I think that um, I don't want to, I really don't want to be down on disciplines. I think they're fantastic. And we only do what we do because we have the deep learning of disciplines. They are entirely complementary. Like I couldn't be an economic historian without drawing on just the, the wells of knowledge from economics and from history. Uh, it's not the work that I'm doing, but I need that in order to do what I do. And so I think that um, sort of recognizing that one, all of these terms are kind of up for debate, and also we really need disciplines as an uh, important point. Thank you. Yeah, one, one on Teams? Yeah, one yeah, yeah, on Teams. Okay, we'll go Teams and then you. Who's on Teams? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I had my hand up. I've got two comments really, Claire. One, the first one is the way I feel at the moment, I'm probably a going to God professor rather than anything else, but that's a whole other issue. The, the second one I wanted to make, and thank you so much for that presentation, and also all of the, the comments are really interesting to listen to. One of the things I don't think we do very well 
at a general level, though, is working together, for want of a better phrase, to market interdisciplinary <laughs> research to our various audiences, both within the universities and outside. Uh, and I think that's a big issue because I think what we tend to do is to um, uh, leave ourselves within the current frameworks and not try and change them. And one of the things I'd love to do with anyone that's uh, attending today or anyone that might be interested is how can we work together to, to start messaging differently, both to our universities and to the audiences outside. And particularly the audiences outside uh, in business and what have you that I deal with, they're very, very um, enthused by interdisciplinary research. They get it, they, they, it's the kind of thing that they're looking for. So I think we've got a very uh, empathetic audience out there. We just need to work together to, uh, to drive it a bit. Yeah, look, and I think that's a good perspective. Um, and uh, I mean, we'll see. I, I think I disagree with you on some, some levels and it really does depend on the management and who's in charge. It's so localised, um, depends on your department or your faculty or whatever. But there are, uh, you know, the, one of the last points I made was about like markers of success and how do we uh, promote, how do we choose what to count in order to demonstrate value to various audiences. So I think that there's, I have lots of suggestions, maybe for an offline situation, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Good. Um, <clears throat> I was interested in the follow up from what David had just said, in that most of the discussion and talk about the impact is all within the organisation. I had the experience in the early 90s of piloting a different way of presenting education through TAFE. And we were designing a college which the students could attend at any time, exams at any time. We tried to free up the parameter. This worked well in theory until we started to use it. And then we found the students arrived all at the same time and left at the same time because that's what they'd done for the previous mm. 10 years. Mm. Their parents were most upset because the students, when they kicked their teenage boys out of bed, their teenage boys said, we don't have to get there by nine o'clock. But the biggest difficulty we ran into was in actual fact the organisation and the expectation of the public that the school would operate a certain way. And it did, and gradually the innovation whistled away. It, it seems to me that that's partly the problem you're identifying there, and what David mentioned. If you're going to get interdisciplinary out there, then it's got to be more out there than just the head of your university, which is the point my experience suggests is very difficult to do, I can tell you. Yeah, Tom, that's a really good point. And I think that um, one of the, the things that I mentioned at the top is the compact between universities and the professions. So in order to go, okay, we uh, one of the challenges is that in order to um, move away from disciplines as like the prime thing, we have to like not be a professional-based society, which, we, you know, so that's one of the main things is that in universities reflect and reinforce what's going on in the general society as well. And so um, your, your point is completely valid about how um, it's not just who's at the top or, or the yeah. managerial structures, yeah. Um, question from Simon. Hi, Simon. Hi, Claire. Great to see you. Great to see everyone. Uh, fantastic. Really enjoyed your talk, as I always do. Um, a few, a few comments. <laughs> Pardon me? You would know most of it at this point, though. Well, yeah, yeah. True. Um, but still good to hear it. Um, so this question, a few points. The, the question of um, the interdisciplinary challenge, the point you made at the beginning that we've discussed on other occasions about um, the value of interdisciplinary research, but the institutional opposition by universities and the ARC, nothing is changing on that front. Um, the ARC still makes noises about valuing interdisciplinary research, but it's not reflected in their policy. It's exactly the same with universities as well. I share your frustration, but I'm just, what do we do next, I guess, is my, my question on this. 
a couple of other uh, observations. As you know, I'm in the, in, in the US at the moment, and this is a classic case of never having had economic history departments. So the Scandinavians, by the way, can be added to a list of people that have done. Um, and I'm going to be rude about both economists and historians here, I'm afraid, but you know, that's okay. Um, we get uh, several decades, neither of them cared about economic history. They all care now, that's beautiful. But their notion of economic history in both cases is very difficult, very different from what we conceive. Now, of course, all of these things are subjective. Maybe our conception is wrong. But OK, here comes my insults of both disciplines. The economists, particularly in terms of the, what they now call historical e economics, have no understanding of history or historical context. It's not enough. Uh, I'm sorry to say this, that, that running the data is not enough. You have to understand the history. The historians, on the other hand, have no sympathetic for, uh, sympathy or understanding of economics. It's all about how wicked capitalism is. And if I see another book with capitalism in the title, I think I will scream. So I guess basically what I'm saying is that, that you know, they have such weird and different views of what economic history is that whilst I understand all your concerns about departments, and we probably will never go back to economic history departments, the alternative is also quite scary. And I mean, you, you're sort of well placed. You got an economics degree, and then you had sort of a great PhD supervisor that gave you balance. Now I'm only joking. Yeah, yeah, so you, exactly. do, you, you do have a, a good foot in both camps, but you're quite exceptional in many ways uh, relative to a lot of people of your generation that are trying to sort of do this type of work. They're either stuck yeah. in history or stuck in economics. Sorry for the rant, but I just thought. Yeah, really went for it. Um, <laughs> so, to your first point, I, I you know, uh, look, I, I'm with you on the, the paradox here, right, the, the fact that the institutional structures aren't changing. And um, one of the points that I made is that, like, we have to talk about things that we can do or that we have the power to do, but also accepting that we don't have the power to change everything. And, you know, uh, a psychologist would say to let some of these things go. Um, and we can only do the marketing job. We can only... Um, demonstrate our value to the ARC in the way that we can, right? Like we can kind of hone that language, we can hone um, the cell, but we can't necessarily make them fund X, Y, Z or whatever. Like we can't make them change the FOR code system. We just can't. Um, in terms of the uh, being rude about economists and historians, look, I agree. And that's why that's what we're here for, man. Like we, um, <laughs> like they to kind of, you know, have that conversation between between disciplinary groups is so important and so necessary. Um, and while my experience, I think, is quite unique, um, it's given me uh, probably the insight that that there's no there's no perfect place to be as an economic historian. It's all just like a management system. And I think accepting that uncertainty that like this isn't the solution. We all need to go to economics. We need to be in economics and whatever. I, I don't think that that's the case. And we just need to. Um, live with the uncertainty of, of the way forward. Well, thank you very much, Claire. That was a very well spent hour for all of us uh, and to all the people who raised a very useful discussions and questions. Um, on the question of books, your book is another example of why books are important and it's not the fact that they're ranked <coughs> unfairly in, in terms of um, what universities do, but it's part of the community. You're, the discussion here and the dissemination of the network and the actual value of the knowledge is related to a book. And that's another reason why you know, people with historical ink will always be interested in books. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
and the credibility revolution. Um, this is a topic which I presented a couple of weeks ago to the Economic Society. There's an issue that's been in the back of my mind about what is evidence for evidence based policy, and I thought I'd try and reflect on it. And in short, I think the notion of what evidence is is often taken far too narrowly when trying to present a broader view. But I want to start with almost a, a disclaimer. I've got um, a quote here from Ran Abramovitz saying that we believe that history is important. And every person in this room, no doubt, believes that history is important. I'm hysterian of economics, but I believe history is important. I believe uh, methodologies about you know, dealing with the idea of a period, the curation of what life is like, particular times of important activity. But Rand then goes on to say that typical modern economist does not share this view that history is interesting for its own sake. It's not like what Simon was alluding to in the world. I mean, most economists care about the past only to the extent that it sheds light on the present. So you think of this as the sort of a thick history versus the thin history approach. And my confession at the start is that I'm going to talk in history. Okay, my topic is not, I'm certainly not contesting the, the broad notion of history is important and interesting for its own sake. I'm interested in the question of policy and to the extent that history is important in this case, it's about its relevance to policy. So it's this latter point. Okay, so what I'd like to do is introduce the proposition. The basic proposition is that I think that the idea of evidence for the purpose of evidence-based proposition is considered too narrowly by many, at least by many people in academia and the economics departments. Um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time running through um, that there's a cost with getting evidence. It's not cost-free. We need to be conscious of that. Then to look at extending the idea of what evidence is from the empirical to look at economic theory and economic history. So the basic argument there is that there is uh, a um, basis of evidence that comes from both of those categories and to look at interpreting data and empirical results. So just look at some examples from history and empirics and then finally to have a bit of a plug for my own subfield for the history of economics to say why that's uh, particularly important and then to conclude and conclude that basic that ideas matter. And Ken Clements, who's not here today, but is a good friend, uh, often says that, you know, if you ask rhetorically why are ideas important, is the rhetorical answer is because they're, well, the answer is they're so rare. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so good ideas are rare, and the argument I'm trying to make is that there's a, uh, a, a well from which we can draw ideas in both economics theory and economic history as, as well. Um, just in context, I'd say that, you know, the idea of evidence-based policy has become sort of popular in the last decade, or perhaps a little, little bit more, at least since Kevin Rudd used the term in his uh, you know, early, uh, not 2007 win. But people have, for a long period of time, been focused on collecting evidence and uh, making policy on it. Government institutions are data collectors for the purpose of evidence as to work in the Treasury Department, taxation policy mainly. We had access to an enormous amount of information that could be used for evidential purposes for making policy, giving policy advice. Sort of kind of <coughs> um, the idea of evidence-based policy, I would argue, is going beyond that. It's going beyond it to the extent where um, there's a, a nexus, or at least a nexus with my colleagues in the economics department would seem, would seem to be linking to the credibility revolution. And the credibility revolution is a, a period in economic, microeconomics and empirical studies. I just want to make sure I get the right, the right name of the paper. In 2010, um, a paper by Joshua Angrist and John Steph um, Piskin wrote called The Credibility Revolution, How Better Research Design is Taking the Con Out of the Econometrics. <laughs> and since then, there's been a fair bit of talk about the credibility revolution. That particular paper mentions on no less than 32 times the question causality. Um, it's empirics, empirics are important, but the 
the relevant question of causal inference in the way econometrics can help you deal with the question of causal inference and it is um, key under that credibility revolution to cite from a, a source which is impeccable it's wikipedia <laughs> this credibility revolution the studies derived driving so driving the credibility revolution have made use of better quality data and econometric techniques such as difference and difference, instrumental variables, regression and discontinuity, natural experiments, and randomized experiments. So experiments is one element of it. Um, instrumental variables are types of things that can give you a hand on trying to identify which way causation runs for your equation. Now, my basic proposition is that there's a, a, a concern that that's a too narrow effect. I mean, on the face of it, it's a cliche because evidence is what you want to have policy on. You don't want to make it in a vacuum or, you know, without information. So you want to have the relevant information available. Um, so it's, 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 it's a truism on its face. But of course, it's always going to be partial and it's not going to be the full exclusion of policy. Policy now must be made with imperfect information, firstly because it's dealing with the future, and no information we have will be perfect with regard to the future. Um, so my um, argument here is that evidence can come from many sources. Empirical evidence is one, empirical evidence as it relates to causation is in, within that category. But there's also the relevance of um, um, ideas, important ideas that we can get from history and theory. So <clears throat> let me make the first perhaps objection to it, which any sort of economist would typically make, is that evidence is it has to be acquired. Information is not available, it has to be procured or it has to be produced, all of which has a cost. First thing you would decide when in trying to acquire the, um, the information or evidence is you have to make it an estimated judgment about its future worth and how much you're willing to spend spend on it. It's also has implications for universities and for policy bodies themselves. As do you get the information by contracting it out to a, um, a research company, which can undertake the research using you know, the, the best econometrics, or do you have it publicly funded through your university system with work being being done? So there's a sum question which I won't get into about whether it's been publicly funded or privately funded or case-by-case or, or case funded. Um, but the bottom line is that it's not an open checkbook. Evidence has to be paid for and some sort of judgment about what its purpose is. And the second point here is that it's not exclusive. It's going to be necessarily partial. So you need to, in my judgment, refer to other areas as well. Okay, let's move on to the uh, extending the scope of evidence beyond empirical. So my first point that I'd like to make um, in that regard is that fundamentally I'm a believer in positivism, that uh, economic theory, which has been evolving for more millennia, but in its modern form, at least for centuries, has been progressively accumulating um, insights based on empirical observation. It's general theory, so it's not specific to every particular circumstance, but at the general level, the, the sort of stylized fact, if you like, which is sometimes sort of used, is re often reflected in theory. So um, I think, as I look in policy, economic concepts were particularly important, like opportunity cost, even downward sloping demand curve. These are empirically observable facts and so they fall within the category at least i think of evidence that can help at a very general level inform policy another concept which is very important was the suggestion of market failure or externality this uh, is a, an idea that fits well in economic theory and it's trying to really say what your limits of economic theory are and what you might need to do to correct it and you know, there's all sorts of debates about whether it's property rights, the problem or the externality. But these are issues which fall in the category that should be considered within the evidentiary process of policy in my judgment. Um, 
Notwithstanding all that, you often find that when policy is developed, you end up with substantial gaps. This idea that I'm advocating that theory is, um, is positive and general, because it's positive and general, it's necessarily abstracted, and so that he misses a lot of things. And the most common evidence of where theory fails when it's used to policy used in policy areas concerns crisis. So the 2008 global financial crisis is a very, very um, easy example to think of. You know, up until then, if you're talking macroeconomics in Australia, the open economy and macroeconomics would be the main things. The external balances, the idea that you could run uh, stimulus policies domestically would be you know, set aside because of concerns about exchange rates, effects on interest rates, effects on inflation. You put them aside. What happened in 2008 when the global financial crisis had? We all reverted to talking about Keynes. Keynes who wrote theory when there was a last great depression. This is largely closed economy macroeconomics, but we started to speak about it as possible solutions. We sought assistance from theory that was old, and we learned from the future as well. So what did you have? The G20 would meet, and everyone had stimulus policy. So it leaked out, it leaked out, but it was going to leak in from other countries. Central banks met. The heads of central banks from the G20 met. What did they do? They accommodated the fiscal stimulus. So all of the concerns that you often have in a, in a, in a long crisis period about um, you may, may create disadvantage if you're trying to stimulate your economy because of international effects were put aside. And the, the logic for doing it came from theory of ideas from Musk. So it's the economic history side here that if there was a crisis, and there's also an intellectual history, history, there was theory that was pertaining to that crisis, and those things became combined. And for me personally, it was also interesting to see people like um, Marcus Sen reviving old debates. He was talking about the Goo, the Goo solution. You know, Keynes was trying to slay the Goo during the Great Depression, and Keynes was saying, well, actually, if you want to understand the forward looking, the myopic forward looking behavior and why people are behaving like that. And becoming too, too concerned to invest, we need to go to the Goo. So, again, he was pointed to go to a thinker from a previous age when these things were being discussed. So, that says to me that the theory essentially is, um, is important. You can also ask about you know, the central banks and so fiscal and monetary policy on both sides, I think, tended to look for ideas in the past. In, in regard to monetary policy, the prevailing wisdom was sort of a modern version of the of, um, Vixellian economics, essentially the quantity theory working via the instrument, by the interest rate, yeah, as, your, as your transmission mechanism. Um, but again, when the global financial crisis hit, that conventional monetary policy was placed by non-conventional monetary policy. Endogenous money, this goes back to, you know, the schools of centuries ago when monetary policy was first being debated whether money's endogenous or exogenous, these sort of issues came out through too. Now, in regard to economic history, I just wanted to note that um, in the global financial crisis, we were probably fortunate in that Ben Bernanke was the government, was the chair of the Federal Reserve. And in a celebration of Milton Friedman's 90th birthday, he, in his celebratory article, wrote, I first read a monetary history of the United States early in my graduate school years at MIT. I was hooked, and I have been a student of monetary economics and monetary history ever since. There's neat evidence of the relevance of both theory, monetary theory and monetary history and the wrong of monetary policy. There's no stronger statement than that. And even in the case of the Reserve Bank of Australia, I, mean, I think we did very well during that period, largely isolating our, ourselves from it. I mean, the, the bank was accommodating the fiscal expansion, this is the first tranche, made an error in it, it started to increase rates too soon and then had to put them down again. So it's not totally um, free of criticism from that period. But one of the reasons why I think it did so well was that it had people in its um, the system stability branch in the 1990s. This is um, Shay Fisher and Christopher Kent writing 
worrying internal purposes, <laughs> two depressions and one banking system. So There's a very great study of the 1890s depression and the financial crisis that occurred and the 1930s. And how are they similar and how are they different? And so when 2008 strikes, I'm conscious that these people are sitting around giving advice, knowing that they've actually looked at the 1890s and 1930s and you're having to learn from those those periods. Um, so that, that, I think, is another illustration of where economic history has proved useful in response to what's going on. Okay, let's move to interpreting data. Um, one of the points about theory and data is, how, well, how do you interpret the data? What's the basis? Do you want, what perspective do you employ to try and observe the relevance of data? I thought I might do that with a historical example. So Thomas Munn, who in 1622 was a Board of Trade and member of the East India Company, um, wrote his famous work, England's Treasure by Foreign Trade, or the Balance of Foreign Trade is the Rule of Our Treasure, as was posthumously published in 1664 by his son. It's it's worth reading, by the way, it's a, it's a very thoughtful book. But how was policy done in this time and was it evidence-based policy? Well, I would say it actually is evidence-based policy. Um, mercantilism, based on this particular work, is basically observing that um, it's a stock of species and then propositioning that species is the wealth of the country. Let's look at what happens with trade and see how that species flows. What stock of that species with or without protection? Okay, so in a in a purely evidence-based approach, evidence is collected and a decision is made. The point here is that it's interpreted from a theoretical perspective, i.e., the perspective of mercantilism that he was writing in this book. So it's not until like John Locke and David Hume saying, hang on, this is what we now call the quantum theory of money. It's just going to easily uh, inflate away those things. That's not real wealth, per se. And then, you know, people like Adam Smith coming along and saying, well, you work until this is the point. It's not about stock of wealth. It's about a flow. It's, G it's GDP in current terms. It's the flow of income. It's the flow that's creating the wealth and how it's consumed by consumers. So you have total reorientation re thinking. But the same empirical data about trade and protection, totally different answers because of, of the theory. Um, probably just, I'm just going to go through it a little bit quicker. Um, this I'll do very briefly. I was taught by Ian Van Dresden, so it's nice to hear Ian's uh, name mentioned. He taught uh, an economic history class that I did, and I remember it well. He spent a lot of time talking about uh, the new economic history. Um, so um, Prince Redliff was put as the traditional economic historian who didn't like counterfactuals that you know, Fogel and others were done, and then Fogel was writing. And I remember the heat that existed and you know, the arguments that I had over counterfactuals uh, and the role of empirics in that area. I put that here for today because I know that I'm significating economic history used in policy and this in addition to using empirics and policy, not in place of, but in addition, I'm certainly not anti empirical in any sense. Um, so there was a hot debate in that, and that debate has gotten even hotter. I'm not an economic historian, I've done reading in this topic later, uh, and the uh, geometrics has sort of gone on, has been accused at various stages of killing economic history um, or, or, or whatever. But there is this debate about the method. In my view is that method doesn't, it's, the method is secondary. It's the historical question. As long as the tail doesn't wag the dog, as long as you haven't got an empirical strategy that you're looking for data to test your empirical strategy, because that's not history, that's technique. If you've got a historical question, and that historical question can be advanced in a literal sense or in other historical, other historiographies, or with maps and, and empirical testing, that's that's the second order question. That's just, what well, is it appropriate for your job? And that's sort of where I where I sit. And to give some warning, I, I looked at this quote from Robert Solo. Why should I believe what the empirical analysis, when the empirical analysis is applied 
to thin 18th century data, something that carries no conviction when it is done with more ample 20th century data. It's just a bit of a warning. Don't be seduced by the fact that it's been empirically run. It's a concern about really about theory being used to backcast data. You're collecting data out, you've got missing points all over. Hey, you're filling in with the theory, then you apply your the theory, and you're just really saying what sort of simple model you suggested. But where I ended up sitting after reading it was this view here that by having a deep knowledge of historical setting, economic historians are in a good position to shed light on the mechanism underlying statistics. In other words, they're complementary. Mm. Direct qualitative evidence from historians of the period or primary or secondary historical source is, in my opinion, more convincing evidence for the underlying mechanism than an interaction term in a regression. The primary point is it's the primary historical document, which is important. The other stuff will complement it. That's sort of where I ended. And on policy, I'm not the same. It's the story, it's the finding of all these methods which is relevant to your policy, not the argument over whether it's incorrect or not. Okay, excuse economic. No time for Yeah, no time for <laughs> economic ideas. I'm, I'm back in the department. <laughs> I shall um, skip over that and go straight to the conclusion. Okay, so. My conclusion is that you must ask what does cost benefit considerations suggest if it's worthwhile? We have to at least ask a cost benefit question. Theory and history should be regarded as important in critically evaluating data and empirics. We have to at least take the role of history when looking at it. We're not using sorry, history and theory, we're not using history and theory, we're probably using something else. We're probably using some interpretive perspective. Okay? So we need to at least ask what that is. Um, it might be econometric theory, but it, there may well be other things. Worst of all, probably ideology that might sit through. General economic ideas develop from previous ideas which are observed, so I'm arguing that at least the general elements of economic theory are empirical and therefore form, form, uh, based on positive economic thinking. For me, they're relevant to policy. The danger in all of this is ideology, and this is where I explored the idea of the evidence-based theory is that you don't want policy being um, dogmatic in an ideological sense. And the appeal to evidence-based theory is saying, will it achieve what you want to do? And I think that's useful um, for economists, whenever they're looking at the use of theory in policy, they should always ask, is this theory being used in a way just to rationalise an ideological point? It's another way mm -hmm. theory is sometimes used, so I've got to be mindful of that. But this is things to be mindful of. And I'll end with a, when I gave this presentation to the Economic Society, a person put up a hand and said, look, there's this paper by Nate and Bresnow called Observing Many Researchers Using the Same Data and Hypothesis Testing, and it basically revealed different results. So does great administration reduce support for social policies among the public, yes or no? They had 161 researchers. They recruited 161 empirical researchers and they formed 73 terms and said, go away, test that proposition. Here is the data source. You cannot use other data. Here is the data. Go away and test it. This paper has 161 authors, so when you open it up, the first three pages of the 161 <laughs> people. Um, and they found that there was, a, in this result, they found that there were 1,261 models created and 166 distinct research design models are programs designed to use. And here's the result. <laughs> Very strongly positively <laughs> correlated. Very negatively correlated. Everything in, in between. Now I'm not I'm really not trying to be little empirical research because I do believe it is relevant. This is the only study I'm aware of where people were trying to test this question of can you, using the same information, the same data, come up with the same answer? <laughs> it took what's going to be published. It's going to be these studies or these studies because these would be all uninteresting. Okay? And yet that would suggest that there's no real um, clear answer to that, to that question. So that's another reason don't rely solely on empirics. It doesn't make good sense in terms of history. It doesn't make good sense in terms of theory. Thank you very much. Any questions? Michael. Yeah. 
Just a quick question since you're on that slide. Yep. I mean, you'll be interested to see um, whether that 73 team needs to respond to 73 sets of referees. Because then the result will be again very different. Yep, yep. So there's another layer to it. As another instance, it mentioned the research groups were given the information what the others had got and asked, do you want to change your model? And all of them said no. Okay. And the other point was that of those 15% could be accounted for by either coding errors or by um, bias, sometimes a bias is identified. 85% of these variations is unexplained. That is, nobody, everyone thinks it's reasonable what other, the referees are doing. They can't say who is it. Okay. You didn't have the rest of uh, Bernanke's quote at Friedman's birthday, but he acknowledged, uh, Friedman, you were right, the Fed caused the Great Depression, yeah. and we will not do it again. Okay. So, yeah. it's a win for economic history, and of course, the Nobel Prize will be worth for that contribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the latest Nobel Prize winner. Yeah, thanks for that recap. Okay, well, yeah. um, well, I'm on the rocks. We'll make this the last one again. Um, you've done this conversation. Thank you, Michael, for an excellent talk. But um, I have essentially one question. I mean, on yep. the fourth point, your conclusion to say something about danger of ideology, right? Yep. I just wonder what are your reflections, for example, when um, empirical evidence in this kind of credibility revolution you know, in economics is sort of, you know, confronted with the policymakers, right? So what I confronted, what I have seen over this year is that there is an increasing tendency, right? The chair makers have this, you know, tendency of cherry picking the evidence that basically suits their belief, you know, so Sunstein wrote something about the anchoring and confirmation, yep. comments, right? So I was wondering, for example, I mean, what is your perspective is, of course, on how do you think that, you know, this kind of danger of ideology can be mitigated, right? Should we rely on meta analysis of, of these empirical estimates ex post? Should we rely on stream bounds analysis, right? Yep. Or because essentially, I mean, how to reach consensus? Here, yep. Right. Because that's essentially, I think, it's one of the biggest dangers and perils at the moment. So this is the <coughs> the three pillars that I was talking about. You know, with theory, history, and and empirics. The concern applies equally to all of them. So that's one way to control it. I mean, you can cherry pick data, you can cherry pick theory, you can cherry pick history, you know, historical conclusions as well. Um, so, ideology is, uh, is, well, it's a difficult thing to, to deal with. I don't really know. I think the ends in most democratic societies is that the communities, when they go to vote, at least are sensitive to issues of ideology and that come together. You just need, I think, as a policymaker, as a, thing, as a, as a public servant, I felt my obligation to try and weed these things out, or at least to be conscious of them. Now, occasionally you wouldn't put something up because of the ideology that the government is not going to do X. At least you, you, you're, you're consciously deciding we won't recommend X because the last three times we've gone up and thrown out and use was given to the head of the bar. So you're conscious of these things, but just to, just to, you know, to have consciousness. I mean, it's a deeper question because there's a question of vision. You know, the actual vision is what, what you think an economy should be. That's not necessarily only ideological, that's a kind of commitment. Um, I'm going to distinguish that between ideology. That's the Schumacherian idea with economic theory. There's a vision underlying economic theory. But if you don't accept that vision, you, you might want to argue that, that what I'm saying is positive economics as it actually has an uh, ideological element to it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, for, for now, we'll just take a half an hour break. I know David, David mentioned that unfortunately we don't have funding for catering for lunch, isn't it? but there is fortunately a cafe here. So if you want a tea or a coffee, go next door. The facilities, the, the toilets are the other, to the end of the foyer and then downstairs. Well, there's also at the end of the, end of the um, foyer to the right, but that's just the, the top door that's locked, so if you flag me, I'll scan you in. So go. The end of the foyer and turn left, but there's no need to scan in. Or the end of the foyer and turn right, but I'll have to scan in there. Okay, so let's resume a few minutes before um, 11 o'clock. Thank you. Cool. I'm on. How are you? Two, three. Like a, uh, one of the last one. Me too. Hello. 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 Hello.
Oh, well. I was kind of finish that thing before I was going to go to the race. Last time I was in London, I was in the same time. So we may need to tail a little bit before the end of the